Well, I have a lot to talk about, so I think I'm going to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Lenigan, and uh, the name of this talk is Just About Everything You Know About Wilderness Survival is Wrong. Uh, what originally motivated this was the fact that there's a lot of other talks out there that go on about how hackers are really awesome at wilderness survival, and because we're creative thinkers and, you know, um, innovative problem solvers and all like that. And all that's true, but there's another factor that I've noticed in, well, when hackers get together in large groups that seems to occur, and that's a gross lack of planning. Um, I have a couple of anecdotes that I could uh, um, relate to you. One uh, was uh, from uh, Jeff Wilkie Smith when he went to Chaos Communications Camp back in, I think it was 2007, uh, on the original Hackers on a Plane trip, which itself resulted from a lack of planning. Um, so when they finally got to their destination in Germany, it was getting on towards evening, the temperatures were falling, and it was starting to rain. And the Jeff realized that the first thing that needed to happen was that these tents that were going to be their homes for the week needed to be uh, picked, directed, etc. And um, immediate, pretty much immediately, one of the other people on Hackers on a Plane, I'm not sure who, and even if I did, I wouldn't tell the names, said, you know, I really need to set my laptop up right now and check my email. Um, and if this is your first response in what could be a survival situation, you might need to think about reprioritizing what uh, is important. And th uh, furthermore, there's also tour camps, which I know a crew from Nauticon went to that. Um, and actually, they pretty much saved the day because the organizers of tour, cam tour camp also suffered from a huge lack of communication, planning, et cetera. They didn't tell people, oh yeah, you're going to be camping on top of a, of a pile of volcanic dust that causes sore throats of the lungs and asthma and all these sorts of effects. And it's really hot and dry there. I know you think about Oregon as being this rainy, you know, damp, cool place, but this is a desert, basically, that you'll be camping in. Um, and there's no shelter. So whatever you bring with you, that's it. So a lot of people, including the organizers themselves, because their duties of film collapsed, were, were really suffering in this camp. And, you know, that and um, also some comments from fellow friends and everything like that was what uh, motivated me to put this together. So we'll get on with it. It's, um, oh, I, I should also ask a question real quick. Just a show of hands from the audience. Um, how many of you are currently active duty military, like in the Air Force or, you know, um, that sort of thing? Anybody? No? Okay. How many of you are regularly fly in light aircraft over unpopulated areas? Great. This is the talk for you because most of the survival information out there is literally geared towards those two exact scenarios and really doesn't apply to the kinds of problems that people like us get into. Um, so I'll take a page from Rogue Clown and, and talk about what this talk is not about. It's not about surviving the zombie apocalypse or other similar, well, first of all, I have a problem with the zombie apocalypse, namely that um, where are these zombies at all, ever, once? I mean, you know, it's a fictional idea. Why do people spend so much time on, on an edge case? And then there's this, this, this uh, um, idea that, well, it's an analog for something else. Well, if it's an analog for something else, why not talk about the something else? Um, even preparing for, say, you know, aftermath of nuclear war, that's at least, a, well, well, very distant at this point in time, a proximal, credible threat, although, frankly, um, if the balloon really does go up, it's probable that uh, you don't want to survive it. Um, it's also, like I was getting into, it's not about the hardcore survival, escape, evasion, resistance classes that the military teaches, because soldiers in the field have another, a number of additional problems that we civilians don't. They have people they don't want to be found by. That would be very bad to fall into enemy hands. That's so there's a lot of you know, time spent in their coursework talking about how do you resist interrogation, how do you flee from the enemy, et cetera. Uh, in our case, if we're in the back of beyond and we didn't want to be there, we're going to be really glad to see anybody out there, like the Coast Guard or the National Guard or et cetera, uh, local Boy Scout troops. Um, and like I said earlier, it's not about survival scenarios encountered by denizens of light aircraft flying over remote areas. Um, so what it is about is 
surviving long enough in extreme conditions to summon and receive rescue or help. I mean, that's, that's basically what it comes down to. You know, that, that you're not planning on, okay, civilization's collapsed, and now I'm living in this little hut for the rest of my life, eating acorns and pine needles and, you know, figuring out how to filter chemicals out of my water or whatever. You, you know, you're, you're, you want to get back to life as you know it, life where you are, you know, whatever happened to get you out there, whether it was, you know, your car broke down on a distant road or got stuck in the mud or, you know, you're just out hiking, camping, hunting, whatever, and it got dark and now you're lost and you're going to just spend a night out there. You're planning on getting back. Um, and that's what I'm talking about with, like, self, being able to self-recover, you know, keep your wits about you and, um, you know, have a plan for how you can get yourself back and failing that, you have a plan about how to contact other people to, you know, help you get back. And the most important thing I hope people would take from this talk is that they could, you know, to foster their own preparedness oriented mindsets and um, to think about planning ahead of time to avoid getting into bad situations in the first place. And now we'll get to, this is crucial and critical. The most important thing that you should have in your survival kit is the mental discipline and self-control to keep yourself under control and to keep focused on the tasks you're going to need to perform at hand. You must have the will to survive no matter what obstacles you see or encounter. You must, you know, basically, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do to metaphorically get your game face on, do that. In my case, when these things happen, I tend to get very angry. But I don't get angry at the people around me. I get angry that I got into this situation. I'm really pissed off. And so I get angry at the problem and I go to war with the problem, and then the problem gets solved. Um, in one case where my brother and I were out hunting, um, he took a wrong turn in, in the Jeep, and suddenly the Jeep is in like three feet of mud, and he kind of lamely says, maybe you could get out and push. And I'm like, dude, the Jeep weighs like 3,000 pounds. I weigh, uh, you know, maybe 250. I don't see the physics of this working out so well. I think we need to tow truck. We're miles and miles and miles from cellular service, which is our only communication method right now. Oh yeah, it's getting dark, it's getting cold, and the rainstorm is moving in, so we're in the same situation as CCC camp, except that we realized checking our email was not priority number one. Um, so that's where I learned that I can hike at seven kilometers per hour sustained, because that's what the GPS was saying I was doing while we were hiking to the road where we knew we should get to a call out to the tow truck company. Um, the survival mindset, like I was saying, do what it takes to foster your primal will to survive. This will empower you in ways you could not previously imagine, like, like in my case, I get angry. Um, and it will help you overcome obstacles. You also want to maintain control of your emotions and focus rationally on the tasks at hand. You know, you don't want to get into a bickering argument or, you know, break down and cry and, you know, feel sorry for yourself. None of this helps you or the people you're with right then. You, you want to maintain situational awareness. And what, what I mean by this is you want to be always aware of your environment in a, you know, 360 degrees around you, you know, po possibly even over your head. You know, if you, if you, if you might see, like, a low-flying aircraft signaling to them with, you know, even a CD out of your car or something like that could be the way that you get help. Um, so, you know, and you also are have to be aware that, you know, um, there might be resources around you that you will notice by being observant. You know, just a, a tiny little crack on the ground might tell you where animals that you could use for food are, or, you know, um, a trickle of water might lead you to a lake that you could fish in, things like that. So that's what I'm talking about with situational awareness. Um, more on the survival mindset, you want to keep yourself busy, particularly if you're going to be there for a while, because that allows you to focus on the tasks at hand, building shelter, gathering firewood, um, anything like that, because you, by keeping yourself occupied, your energy is being used in a useful manner rather than spent, you know, um, worrying about things. And also, you'll be accomplishing tasks which will boost your morale. And this is also very important. Always believe that you'll make it and you'll be found. Working toward this is also a good idea. Um, obviously, just believe, yeah, we're going to be fine. We'll just sit around, you know, drink some water, whatever. You want to work towards that. You want to do whatever you can to improve your advantage. Um, and really, this is, this is crucial. This is what I want a lot of people to walk away from. 
preventing problems in the first place is really the way to go. Um, there's the little, like, I think they're called spot um, GPS receivers that you can have the panic button that sends email to ten addresses or whatever, and it has a monthly subscription. Well, that's all great, you know, if you want to pay hundreds of dollars for the device and the monthly subscription and all like that. But you can have the same effectiveness by just telling somebody, hey, we're going out camping for a week on the Appalachian Trail. We'll be between these two points, and we expect to be back in civilization at this town on this date. If you don't hear from us in like a day or two after that, you know, tell people, you know, tell the authorities along the trail, the, you know, the National Park Service or the, um, you know, DNR Forest Rangers or whomever is out there who manages that area, that they should start looking for us because we're now overdue. We're lost. That's what I'm talking about with the break point. That, you know, that they, you, you tell them specifically, if you don't hear from me by this day and time, call in the cavalry. Um, and, and, you know, that's a free way of getting the same service as Spot. Uh, now, granted, it doesn't tell them exactly where you are, so if you want that, that's where, you know, the GPS gadget would be good, but um, I'm trying to keep costs low here, because, well, I'm on a budget, and I know most other people are. And this is also important. Prepare and pack your own kit. There's a lot of these prepackaged um, survival kits that you can buy in military surplus stores or camping stores or... Um, even like Myers or Walmart, you can get the little like penguin mint tin size survival kit in a can. Um, those ultimately turn out to not be very useful because you don't know what's in them until you open them up. And maybe you're not really good at using that stuff. Like for example, I'm not a good fisherman. I know this. So I am, however, a good hunter. So in my kit, if I'm looking for like indigenous food collection methods, I'm going to focus on hunting because that's my strong point rather than fishing where I could be drowning worms for weeks on end and still not catch a fish. Um, and likewise, those small kits, everything is packed in there so tightly that under the stress of a survival situation, good luck getting all that back in the kit if you have to, um, you know, if you're trying to like keep it in a pocket or something. Uh, I personally like to keep my kit in a big bag so that way I can just chuck stuff in there if I have to put it all back together again. Um, so it's always, it's always better to put stuff together that you know you're going to use, that you know you're going to find useful, that you know how to use, and to practice with those things, rather than expecting a, an off-the-shelf um, off solution to do everything you expect it to. Um, always carry your kit with you. I've actually talked to people who are like, oh, I've got all this stuff, you know, in my cabin, in my car, et cetera. So when I'm camping, it's, and I'm like, okay, so you're camping and your cabin's where? And then you're where out where? You're miles and miles away? Okay, so how is that going to help you if you suddenly get, you know, soaked in a downpour or your car breaks down and the stuff's back in the cabin or you're out hiking and, you know, run into a medical emergency or something and your stuff's back in the car? I mean, you know, you, you, this is something that's important enough, you want to keep it with you. And this is also very important. I've seen, you know, there's a, particularly I've heard from people in the military, they tend to, some of them, not so much like the Special Forces guys, but um, regular soldiers tend to view this stuff as like a gadget or a gimmick or, you know, James Bond stuff. But your kit is not a toy. It's a very important piece of equipment, and you should reserve it for emergencies. Also, the survival rations, no matter how yummy they look, you want to keep those really for an emergency. If you want snacks or, you know, stuff to amuse you, that's carried in, into addition to, in addition to your survival kit, not in place of it. Um, and, your, and, your sur and, and also, your survival kit should not take the place of these items. Um, and there's basically seven areas of survival. I combine communications and navigation because there's crossover in those areas, um, and they s and one tends to support the other. Um, I, mean, I suppose there's other ways to organize this, but this is my choice. Uh, clothing, shelter, food, water, first aid, like I said, communications and navigation, and self-defense, um, which I really didn't see a lot that dealt with the matter in a, in a, in a manner that, that seemed useful to me. Um, there's a lot of like survivalist stuff where they're worried about Red Dawn or you know, zombie apocalypse or whatever. And then there's a lot of um, 
literature out there from like backpackers and so on, who seem to tend to believe that everything in nature um, is happy to see you. And maybe it is, but maybe it's happy to see you because it's a black bear and it hasn't eaten in a week. Um, so we'll go through these point by point, one at a time in, in more detail. Clothing, first of all, the very, very most important piece of clothing that you're wearing is your footwear. Your feet are your way of getting around no matter what. If you can walk, be really, really glad of that fact. Um, and you want to make sure that your boots are suitable for the climate you're, you're going to be in. Obviously, Arctic boots in the desert is not a good way to go, and vice versa. Um, but generally speaking, there, there are many characteristics that are common across good footwear, good boots. You want uh, good traction and ankle support. You want to have make sure that it's got an appropriate amount of insulation and warmth for what you're doing. Because um, cold feet is the best way to lose your morale right there. Also, wet feet. So there we go with uh, waterproof is the next point. Um, and I, I'm big on this because I'm flat-footed. It's my Irish heritage. You want arch support. So if your boots don't come with any kind of internal support, look around for orthotics, you know, Dr. Scholl's, whatever, whatever works for you. Put that in there so that you feel very, very comfortable in those boots and can wear them for a long time because you're going to be wearing them for a long time. Um, for daily use, I always wear these uh, Caterpillar um, leather upper rubber uh, lug sole lower steel toed boots, and I could probably fight hike for miles in them if I had to. If I'm out in the wilderness, there's another pair of boots I wear that are made by the Rocky Corporation called Rocky Alphas that are Finsulate and Gore-Tex and have um, like a low impact lug sole on them. They're so waterproof, I've literally waded through streams and not gotten wet as long as the water doesn't go over the tops of them. Uh, they're also so warm that I've worn them down into like, um, you know, minus 20 degree below days and not had any problem. And what's great about the Gore-Tex is it breathes, so you don't really get that, that moisture buildup that causes um, your feet to get cold in the wintertime. Um, also, footwear is protection. You know, there's, there's, this is again, you know, the, unlike the backpackers that seem to think that everything's great out there, there's a lot of stuff out there that can really start to ruin your day if you're going to be out in the wilderness for a long period of time. Um, thorny vegetation, poisonous vegetation, like poison ivy, poison sumac, poison oak. There are others out there, uh, but those are the main ones in North America. And yeah, you can treat this, but it's much better to prevent it in the first place. Um, rough, rocky ground, if there's, if there's any kind of sharp object, they can, you know, in, uh, I know a lot of people like these five fingers now, but they're basically glorified aqua socks, and I would hate to hike over sharp rocks in those things. I w I'm, I'm not even sure if they would prevent against puncture or that sort of thing. And, you know, venomous insects, we don't really have, uh, well, I'm, I'm from Michigan, so I'm kind of coming at it from, from that perspective of like the northern North American wilderness, and we don't really have many venomous animals there, like um, spiders or snakes. There's like basically one of each, Bromida creeks and the Mesa Bugle Rattler. But um, as you go south, as you get into other climates, there's more and more of those, and wearing boots that could prevent, you know, a rattlesnake from biting through it, or, you know, getting into black widows or, or um, other creepy crawlies that might give you a venomous bite would be a good thing. And they also, this is very important, they prevent blisters and injury to your feet. Um, a blister can take you down just as fast as an insect bite, or I mean, m maybe not as badly as a snake bite, but if you get a bad blister, you're going to be virtually immobile until you can get it stabilized and treated. And that could take several days, and that m might be time that you don't have to spare. Um, also, socks are very important. They're almost as important as boots. I recommend wearing two pairs inside of your boots, a thinner inner cotton sock, and then a thicker wool or synthetic sock over it. And this combination, the inner sock will absorb the perspiration from your foot, and the outer thicker sock wicks it out of that inner liner so that your foot stays dry inside the boot um, from your own perspiration. And by staying dry, it's going to stay warm in the winter. And actually, that perspiration in the summer is the cooling mechanism of the foot. So even though it doesn't seem immediately logical, it also help, this, this setup also helps you keep your feet cool in the summertime. 
Um, one, of the main, one of the biggest questions people have asked me on different jobs and when I'm in the outdoors is like, you know, it's 90 degrees out and they see that I'm wearing long pants and boots tucked, you know, with the pants tucked in and these two pairs of socks and they're like, aren't you hot? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I've got this system that's all worked out and it works great for keeping me warm in the winter and cool in the summer. But the important thing is to prevent problems is you should change the socks at least once a day. If they, if they get soaked for any reason, you should, well, hopefully you have spares. If not, you know, try to wash them as best you can, that kind of thing. Um, because you really want to keep your feet in as good a condition as possible um, just to maintain your mobility. Uh, on to outerwear and jackets. Um, I always make sure that I have an appropriate jacket. Um, people will notice that they tend to be festooned with cargo pockets in my case because um, they're good for carrying stuff. And, you know, empty cargo pockets are great if you're, if you're, you know, finding things like, you know, perhaps, you know, wild edible food or, or you know, tinder for your fire or small twigs or, you know, anything that you might think is useful, you can just kind of stick in there. And if you keep some pockets empty for that purpose, it's, um, it'll be a boon to you. But the jacket should be, you know, and this is another thing I've noticed with, with a lot of people particular, I hate to put it this way, but particularly women, but also to a certain extent men these days too, dress more for fashion than for function. And so therefore they're wearing this very, very thin jacket that is whatever the trend is. And then when it gets to the coldest part of the night or the morning, um, they're, in a, they're in bad shape because they're not properly insulated. So value function over form instead of the other way around. It should be waterproof or at least water resistant. If it's not water resistant, you can buy a lot of different uh, of these waterproofing sprays. I know Scotchgard makes one. Um, there's a lot of other competing brands. They're all basically the same compound. And if you spray that on any clothing or boots or anything like that, it's not going to make them totally impervious to water. But in a situation where you might be in like a drizzle or a light rain or that sort of thing, it makes your jacket almost as good as rain gear. Um, although if you get, you know, something like um, the more expedition grade jackets like from Columbia or that sort of thing um, that actually are water resistant, waterproof, that's the best way to go. Uh, also very important, if you're in the outer doors or, or expecting to be or maybe, you know, just wanting to prepare in case you are, Dress in multiple layers so that way you can always adjust how much insulation you have so that you don't overheat and perspire and soak your clothing and which will make you then colder at that point. Um, and you know, the basic, the basic uh, layering would be an inner insulating layer and outer windproof or waterproof cells or layers. Um, pants should be ruggedly constructed and, and um, able to like bust through brush. Like basically if you're, if you're hiking in a place that doesn't have trails or you know, Something's happened where you have to go through raw wilderness. Um, you want clothing that's going to be rugged enough that sticks and twigs and branches brushing up against it aren't going to snag it or tear it or otherwise um, cause you problems. If they're waterproof and windproof, that's a plus. Um, most of the time what I wear is not, but um, I usually find that the, the outer top layer being waterproof is good enough. I always wear long pants so that I can blouse them or tuck them into boot tops because this also helps preventing the snagging on obstacles and it prevents um, pests and parasites and you know poisonous vegetation from getting inside there to your legs and your feet. Um, I'm pointing out deer ticks here. They carry Lyme's disease which can be immediately debilitating in a flu-like sense. Um, and if it's left untreated, it has very, very severe long-term neurological and uh, joint uh, problems associated with it. So basically, um, the deer ticks are about the size of the period in a 12-point font. And um, that's all they're going to look like until they start sucking your blood. Um, and they leave a bite that will have a tiny little red um, pimple in the middle and a white area around that and then a red inflamed area around that. But that doesn't always happen. So if you're ever out in the, in the wilderness and then sometime about two weeks later you start getting flu-like symptoms, um, if you see a bite like that or even if you don't, I would recommend going to seek medical attention 
because in the first two weeks, it's very, this, this Lyme's disease is very susceptible to modern antibiotics. Um, but after that, the, uh, the spirochete bacteria that cause it migrate into your joints and into slower growing cells in the body and are virtually impossible to dislodge. And at that point, they're going to cause you long-term uh, detrimental damage. Mosquitoes, um, we don't think about this, but um, they carry diseases as well. Um, around here, there's, uh, we've had West Nile virus outbreaks in the U.S. Now granted, that doesn't affect most people, and it probably won't affect most people in this room because it primarily affects the elderly and young children, but a certain percentage of the population is susceptible, so you know, uh, making sure that you're avoiding contact with mosquitoes, which is virtually, well, without insect repellent is virtually impossible. I added leeches because all the survival manuals talk about them. I've personally never had experience with them, even wading through water. Um, it may just be the waters that I wade through, I don't know. I know they're somewhere around North America, but I've never encountered them. Um, and finally, headgear. I really like the boonie hat. Uh, I know Amish one, but Jeff Gilkey Smith does as well. He always wears his. Um, and I think that in terms of like cost and in terms of value, it's, it's right up there at the top because they're cheap, they're waterproof when you get them, they keep the sun off of your neck so you don't get sunburned, they keep the sun out of your eyes, and they keep the rain off of you. And they're also vented so that in hot weather, the airflow can, you know, from on the top of your head, you can, you can get some cooling effects in there. And you can carry small items like, you know, insect repellent or um, maybe a small flashlight or anything like that stuck into the, the loop head uh, band around it. Of course, in colder climates, wear a hat that's uh, like a knit or fleece cap. That would be warmer. Uh, and you could even, if you wanted, double that up, you know, put the fleece cap under the boonie. Um, and now we're getting into other things like the next level of shelter. I'm a huge fan of the Mylar blankets. You can buy these for two or three dollars at places like Meyer or Walmart. Um, those are the main, in the camping, any place that has a camping section, they will have um, lots of little mystery gadgets like this. And they're about the size of the pad of paper in the Nauticon um, bags that we all got. But they unfold to be about, you know, four or five feet by eight to ten feet, and you can wrap yourself completely in this thin layer, which will then reflect 80% of your body heat back to you, and also the outside of it's reflective. So, you know, while you're camping out there in this thing, if search and rescue goes over with searchlights, you're going to be reflecting all that light back at them. So it's just, for two dollars, it's a great bargain. Um, and um, if, you're, if you're out there for longer, you know, if you're if you're expecting if you're not expecting immediate recovery, there's also this plastic called Viscine that you can buy at places like Lowe's, Home Depot. Um, some camping outlets have it as well. Uh, it's basically a thick, non-permeable, um, translucent plastic, and it's pretty inexpensive in even in large quantities. But it, and it packs fairly small, but it's highly waterproof, and you could use it as like a ground cloth underneath a tent or you can actually just build um, a tent out of it. Uh, it also comes in tubes, which makes it great for like making a, an impromptu shelter. If you erect some um, branches into a frame, you can kind of swing this up and it'll, with a, just the one line through the tube, it'll be form a nice shelter. Um, there's also natural shelters. Um, the typical one that people talk about is a lean-to where you take a, you find two trees and then you put a straight branch across them at a certain level, either lash it there or um, just kind of rest it against crooks in your tree branches or that sort of thing, and then pile up foliage on one side of it. And this is kind of the classic like survival bivouac that you see in most of the manuals. The thing about it is though, is if the wind shifts, all that work you did is for naught. So it would be much better, you'd be much better off to build essentially two lean tubes back to back in the A-frame um, which will protect you from all sides and give you a much better shelter. Um, the only downside to some of these, these um, natural shelters is you have to realize that you're, while you're building it, you're also, by taking all of this material from the local environment, you are camouflaging yourself, which is not what you want. You want to be found by search and rescue. So you need to think about um, how you're going to signal them if you're going this route. Uh, if you're building shelters, 
materials that are good to use that will make you waterproof or windproof um, would be something like um, any kind of evergreen boughs. You can loft them up to like 8 to 14 inches thick, uh, either underneath of you or on top of you. And if the branches are oriented so the tips of the branches are pointing down, water will flow naturally down them and not drip on you inside of the shelter. Um, also, the, that loft underneath of you will act as an insulating layer in colder weather. Um, another thing that you can do if you have a large sheet of drift screen um, and not much else, if you didn't have the mylar blanket or whatever, you can make an improvised impromptu sleeping bag by stuffing that, by, by basically making a, a bag out of it and stuffing it with leaves and that sort of thing. And they, if you loft them, they will be an insulation for your dry leaves. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind as well. Now we get on to fire. And I know that's somebody's favorite topic. I'm sure we'll hear more about it at his slide. <laughs> um, you really want to carry multiple fire starting methods in your kit, like waterproof matches. Um, they would be my number one because waterproof strike anywhere matches, that's all you need to, to get a fire going. Um, and they're, they're pretty foolproof. Other people like lighters, but I've found them to, things happen to the fluid. I don't know, at, at least it's just me, you know, that, that by the time I want to use the lighter, it's either low on flu fluid or out of fluid, or the reservoir inside cracks and all of it evaporated and things like that. Um, I personally also like magnesium fire sparks. What these are is a little bar of magnesium, and then on one side there's a, um, another separate material that when you hit it with friction, it creates a shower of sparks. So you kind of take a knife and shave the magnesium off the block onto what you want to start the fire, turn the bar over, and it takes it back to your knife blade, scrape it down there, and there'll be this huge jet of sparks that then ignite the magnesium burning, which will then pretty quickly get your fire going. Um, steel wool and 9-volt battery is also cool. If you happen to have 9-volt batteries in steel wool, if you want to put that in your kit, um, it, if the steel, the steel wool has to be dry, though. That's the, the one problem. Otherwise, it's probably just going to be shorting the 9 volt. But um, if, if you stick the 9 volt in terminals into the steel wool, it will get hot like nichrome wire and start burning. And so you can build your tinder around that and use that as a fire starter. Flint and steel is very old school. Um, it wor it, if you, with a little bit of practice, it works very, very well. Um, I, you know, if, 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 you, if you know what, if you can want to learn what flint looks like and just carry the steel with you and, you know, gamble on the fact that you might find flint, that's a possibility, but, uh, or carry the flint with you. Um, I always talk about the lighter. Glass convex lenses, and I emphasize glass and convex because I've found that plastic lenses usually do not focus light to a point um, because they're molded instead of ground. Um, and you want the convex lens that's going to be concentrating the light into the point rather than a, uh, any kind of concave or meniscus lens that, you know, are like uh, most of our eyeglasses for myopia because they will tend to spread light out. Um, I'm mentioning fire by friction, but I've personally got it to work maybe twice in my life. I mean, everybody thinks about it in these sorts of things, and it's always mentioned in the book, and I know in the Marine survival training, it's required that they figure out how to do it, but um, it really relies on too many different variables to get it to work right. And ultimately, it's very frustrating and you use up a lot of energy trying to get it to work. So I would mainly put one of, you know, several, one of these other several methods in your kit um, before you think about a basewood bow and, uh, you know, a drilling in some log and things like that. Um, other reasons to start a fire than what you might think of, uh, in fact, some in some cases it might, if you have a group of people that you're suddenly in a survival situation, you know, um, I, I can't speculate on, on what that might be, like why you're out, you know, why this suddenly turned into that, but starting a fire can be a very, very powerful symbol to everyone that they're going to make it, that they can work together, that, you know, here's this concrete, useful thing, this task that, that they've completed together that will unite them as a group and 
and help you out because this is not that TV show. We're not voting anyone off the island. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, the, the whoever you're out there with, that's who you have to work with, and you need to you need to think about how you're going to work together. Obviously, fires also provide warmth, although you really want to rely on your clothing for this. I mean, when you, if if it's a situation where you know you were canoeing and your your canoe suddenly capsized in the cold water and your clothes are soaked, then obviously you know fire would be a good way to go there to dry out your clothes and warm you up. But if it's a situation where um, you're in a like a wintertime wilderness survival scenario, it's much, much better to have your insulation and warmth come from clothing than from constantly seeing a fire. Um, obviously, you can use fire to cook food, purify water, and sterilize metal implements, like a first aid for a blister is typically uh, pierce it with a needle, but you want to make sure that needle's sterile. So if you have you know, a means of creating fire, you can sterilize the needle in the fire quickly and then use it to treat your blister. Um, and you can use it as a signal to your search and rescue crew, but you need to think about certain um, parameters of that. At night, you want a bright light, uh, a brightly lit fire, so you'd want you know very dry hardwoods that are going to tend to give you a flame, you know, um, or lots of pine wood that has lots of resin in it to give you that that brilliant that brilliant white light from the fire. During the daytime, rather than well cured wood like for the nighttime fire. You want an initial fire of some, some good burning, well cured wood, but on the top, put any kind of moist, green, fresh vegetation, pine boughs, grasses, that sort of thing, because you want as much of those natural oils and moisture in the fire to convert into a dark smoke column as possible, because that will be seen by hopefully search and rescue aircraft, or if not, the Forestry Service is going to worry about what the heck's going on back there. Um, because they're always on the lookout for forest fires, that sort of thing. So that's things to think about for fire. Um, I really strongly recommend that you carry at least some non-perishable food in your kit. Uh, the meals ready to eat from the military are good, although stay the hell away from the chicken fajitas. That's all I gotta say. Um, I don't know what they did to that, but it really, I opened that pouch up and I'm like, man, this smells like dog food. It's the only one that I hated. All the other ones I've ever had are good and, and surprisingly good. Like, I think they've really worked really hard to make the, the MRE rations uh, taste a lot better these days. Uh, yes? Okay, I have, I have not had those. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. So stay away from the beef frankfurters and the chicken fajitas and you're probably good. Um, beef jerky is good because it's usually sealed in plastic in some way and it'll keep for a while. Granola bars, trail mix, diced fruit, all these things you can get at any, pretty much any store and um, they'll give you a lot of good nutrition, quick, quick energy, that sort of thing. Um, one other thing that I'm mentioning here are marine and aquatic survival rations. What these are, are they're, um, they're like a special for lack of a better term. They're kind of like, um, you know, with a baked survival bar. And they come in little tubes about an inch and a half on a side, packed about six or eight to a foil pack package, and they're designed to be waterproof. And they'll stay on there, like each tube has, you know, 400, 600 calories in it. And depending on what you're, ta what you're doing, like if you're just sitting in a life raft, they'll say, you know, eat one of these every six to eight hours. But if you're doing um, strenuous exercise, like you would be if you were on land, you want to you want to ha have a higher caloric input because you're going to have a higher caloric output. And they just basically tell you to like, you know, eat one of these at this time, drink this much water, and it provides all the nutrition and protein and uh, vitamins and carbohydrates and all like that for that period of time. They're also you know in a package about like this big, so you know you could pack it in a small container on your boat or in a cargo pocket and, you know, carry days worth of food in a small, small package, although I have no idea what they taste like. Um, what? <laughs> yeah, probably not very good. Um, fishing is good because you want, in a survival situation, 
you want to maximize how much energy you're taking in versus how much you're expending. So if you're just sitting there you know, with a fishing pole and you know the fish are biting and you know what you're doing, I don't. But if you know what you're doing, um, you could wind up getting far ahead on your, your calorie budget um, and you have you know, great high quality pro protein. The thing to remember though is you want to practice with tackle that you keep in your kit or tackle like you keep in your kit because it's not going to be the, you know, if, you, if you're an angler, um, the hand line and, and sinkers and leads and all like that that you have in your little survival kit or if you build like a, an improvised pole are not going to be like your fly casting reel or that sort of thing. So, um, and again, I've, I've ran into people who are like, oh, I'm an excellent fisherman and I've got this boat and everything and then I've got this little kit and I'm like, okay, so you practice all this time, you know, casting for, for rainbow trout or whatever off of the boat, but how often do you take out the little, you know, five dollar hand line and a worm and see what you can catch with that? Because uh, it's a it's a very different situation, um, and it's recommended that you be creative with bait. I've heard you know all kinds of things work, like trees and you know the usual things like worms and minnows if you got those, or in insects of any kind. Um, some people have said candy bars work. I don't know. Anything that's uh, attracted to the fish that'll that'll reflect light, or if you have, um, I've even heard that lights that put on there or chem lights put on there like at night will attract certain species of fish and cause them to strike the hook. Um, so, you know, this is where that hacker creativity is a good thing. Um, and then we get on to trapping and snaring, which is all, which is basically the land-based equivalent of fishing, if you think about it that way. Um, because like fishing, you can sit around while your traps are out there doing their thing. The problem is, is that um, in a lot of cases, if you have traps or a snare or whatever, you don't necessarily know what's walking through that. So um, you might get used to eating interesting things in this method. You know, and yeah, Rocco? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point as well. Uh, we'll be getting to that in a little bit. I mentioned self-defense as one of, the, as one of the, the, the points, but yeah. Um, you could also potentially, tr you know, trap something if, um, that you don't want to eat at all. You know, like, uh, yeah, skunk would be a good example. I was going to suggest a coyote. I don't know how, I think I would have to be pretty dang hungry to eat one of those. Um, but uh, that said, there are many, many different uh, useful traps you can make. One of the things I really recommend you keep in your kit is an SAS wire saw. These are uh, a bunch of stainless steel wires braided together with two rings on the end. Uh, and the, and the, the important point is, note this down if you're taking notes, you want the ones made in England, not in China. Um, there's a tremendous difference in quality between them. The English ones are actually what the SAS use. The Chinese ones just look like it. And um, I found out the hard way, the made in China ones tend to break. Uh, but the what's, in what's different about the SAS wire saws as opposed to all the other ones out there is the rings are of different sizes. So what you can do is you can take the small ring and put it through the large one and now you have a loop that you can put over a stick or you know, like if there's a rabbit run or something like that. Um, so if an animal runs through that loop, the loop will now naturally close like a noose and you'll snare the animal. Um, deadfall traps are pretty much what um, you see like the likes of Yosemite Sam and Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny always trying to make with a box or the whatever or the rock and then there's a, um, a stick propping it up in some way that as the quarry walks in, they disturb the they, they disturb the trigger on the trap, and then it either smashes them flat or traps them in the box or that sort of thing. Um, if you're looking to trap something a lot bigger, um, a pit trap is basically the the classic ambush trap. You've dug a pit that's big enough to hold whatever you're trying to trap, and then covered it over with vegetation so it doesn't look like there's a pit there. Um, that's a lot of time and work, and probably a lot more time and work than, than I would like to invest if I'm out in the, yes? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. I was, I was, and basically I was including this section for completeness, and it's always mentioned, so I thought I would mention it, but I, I really think that, you know, it's, it's a lot of work for not a lot of reward. Um, the sapling trap is you take a green sapling and bend it down, and you could, you could combine this with the SAS wire saw so that basically, you know, you've got, you've got a, a, a trigger mechanism on the sapling so that, you know, it, that, that's very like, lightly weighted, so it's kind of like a, a large mouse trap. And as the animal runs through, if it disturbs that trigger, the sapling will then whip it up into the air, and that action will probably break its neck. As it's, and then it's, you know, just hang, it's also, the other advantage of this is that you can hear it going off. And um, when you've got the animal there, now it's up at the top of this tree that, you know, most animals, I mean, maybe a bear would, would figure out how to get at that because they're pretty crafty, but most other animals are not going to be competing with you for the food before you get it. Um, so it kind of like keeps it up out of the way until, until you can uh, take advantage of that. Um, and finally, well, actually not finally, but uh, now we get on to hunting. And this is really, this would be my preferred method because I'm a hunter, um, but it's potentially time and energy intensive. Uh, on the other hand, you can do it while you're doing other things. You know, like if you're, if you're, know that um, you need to move in a certain direction, you can just plan out hunting trips in that direction until you get to where you think you would have a better chance of being quick with that sort of thing. Um, oh wow, I'm, I'm gonna have to speed up here. It'll, <laughs> I, I realized I had a lot of, a lot of information, but um, it gives you greater control of your protein options and will work where you are. But you must know the habits of your quarry, your terrain, the climate, that sort of thing. And you could improvise a bow or a spear or use a firearm from your kit, which is really my preferred way to go. Um, Foraging, in other words, hunting for plants, is also a good option because they don't run away. But you need to know, the, you ha need to have detailed knowledge of what plants are edible and what aren't. Um, the easiest way to go is like nuts, acorns, and berries. If you learn wh where you can get those and which ones are edible, they tend to be similar across large biomes. Um, I would also strongly recommend staying, against, staying away from mushrooms and fungi of all kinds because I've read too many mushroom hunting books and they're all like, well, there's this one mushroom that's really awesome and tasty and stuff, and then there's this other one that looks exactly like it, which will destroy your liver and kill you in like two days of agonizing pain. You know, so why do you want to put up with that when you're already stressed out in a survival situation? Uh, I don't know, I mean, um, and really, now is not the time to shut down your liver, liver or hallucinate. That's not problems you want out there. Now we get on to water, and I'm trying to get through more of this because I'm like, <laughs> I've got way too much of material here. But um, first of all, carry a clean supply with you. Um, the easy way to do it is to buy like the, the bottles of water at the store, and then you can use the bottle while you're out there. But you also want to carry a means of purifying it, like a survival straw that will, you know, it's basically like an activated uh, filter that will filter out bacteria and uh, pollutants and things like that. Water purification tablets are also good, or you can use a very small quantity of bleach, a few drops to a capsule per like a gallon of water will sterilize the water. Boiling is very good, it always works. Uh, but then after you boil it, you wanna strain it or filter it to take out particles and chemicals. Wicking would be, um, you're basically using a wick like a siphon. So you use like a piece of yarn or a piece of cloth and let the water travel up through it and the cloth will be filtering out any chemicals that are in the water. And then there's the classic solar sill where you've got your viscous tarp with a rock in the middle weighted down over a pit and underneath of the rock that's now creating a conical depression, you have your container of water so that the, you know, if you put vegetation in there or, you know, if you're really hard up, you could put your own urine in a, another container there. Like, I don't know why Bear Grylls drinks his own pee. I really don't. I'm like, do this instead. This works and it's water. You, don't, you drink all the good stuff and none of the bad. <laughs> you know, because, um, you know, there's also first aid. Um, you want to have proper training and you can expect that perhaps 50% of your kit might be first aid items. And you need to match your kit to the terrain and climate. Um, essentially, you're gonna wanna make sure that you can treat pain, sunburn, insect bites, minor wounds, and allergic reactions. A uh, larger kit might contain antibiotics, more bandages, and splints, 
even up to like a full EMT kit if you have the training and if you have a large vehicle that you can keep that bag ready. Um, communication. The most important things to remember are the international air to gro ground to air signals. If you can make a large V on the ground in any way, like pine boughs on a snowy field or, you know, exposing a lighter color of dirt underneath of it, V means, hey, we're here, please send help and rescue. Um, in contrast, an X means we're here and we need medical attention. It's basically like a first aid cross. And if you're forced to move, leave an arrow pointing in the direction that you're moving so that aerial crews can know that you're moving in that direction and they should start their search pattern moving in that direction as well. Um, make sure the s that the uh, signals are as large as possible in a large, flat, or clear area and contrasting with the background in color. Um, I'm actually going to skip this because most of the time they don't work if you're way out there. Um, they didn't work for Chuck Muir when he had his uh, maritime accident back during the storm of the century. Um, all they could hear was that his phone was active. So let's move on to uh, radio technologies real quick. There's several unlicensed radio options. Uh, I know Nauticon is currently using FRS radios. Uh, there's also GMRS, which are a little bit more powerful, and uh, some of them times those two are combined. Both of them have very limited power output, however, and they're probably only useful if other people that are out in those areas who are using them. Like a lot of hunters use the FRS and GMRS. So if you're out there and you have one, you can transmit with it, but um, unless there's other people within range, they're not going to hear. There's a new service called Mirrors, multi-use radio service, which doesn't require a license. It's limited to two watts output, whereas FRS is like 500 milliwatts. Um, and it has only five frequencies for use, like basically five channels. Um, but it's on the VHF part of the spectrum, so it's going to have good propagation in, in, in wooded areas, in probably several miles. Um, and you don't need a license, so it's, it's kind of, sort of like ham radio, but without the license. Um, which also brings us to ham radio, which has much higher output than cell phones or unlicensed radio. And depending on which band you use and the atmospheric conditions, you could be talking to the other side of the planet. This is awesome. I like this. You can even send email with it if you want, um, after you've set up your tent. Um, and the thing is, Ham radio requires licensing, familiarization with the technology, and training with the equipment to operate properly. Um, and like everything else, like that, it runs on electricity. I would personally recommend that this is what I do when I'm hunting. I make contact with hams in the local area prior to heading out, so that way I know I'm, I'm basically kind of I'm kind of using them as my person that I'm contacting. Like, okay, I'm going to be back here at 5 p.m. See you on the airwaves then. If you don't hear from me, you know, call the sheriff or whatever. Um, but if you have an HF radio, that person could be in China, con conceivably, or you know Argentina. Like we're making contact with Argentina and Cuba and uh, Italy in the uh, knock on our ham radio there. Oh, and this is very important, which I haven't seen in many places. Um, they're probably going to be using helicopters to search for you. So creating a helicopter landing zone, you need to think about. There's a lot of problems a helicopter has when it lands. Um, you're basically looking for an area about the size of a football field for the size of helicopters they're going to be searching for you with. You want to think about the wind direction. You want to be able, the helicopter needs to have, it wants to land into the wind and take off into the wind, like most aircraft. So if you can find that area that there's a long area oriented that direction with the wind, that's good. The ground must be firm, level, no more than a 5 to 15 percent grade, because if it's more than that, the helicopter has problems taking off and potentially might flip itself on takeoff. Um, and you want to make sure it's free of loose debris, as some people found out um, when they decided to use a dirt road as their LZ. Uh, suddenly there, were gra there was gravel being flung at them from the helicopter's downdraft. Um, there's a 10 times rule about obstacles downrange. Basically, for every the, whatever the height of the obstacle is downrange, if there's a tree that's you know, 30 feet tall, your, the helicopter is going to need a zone 300 feet longer to land in the LZ it, because it has to have an altitude clearance over that tree on landing. Um, if, you, if you keep that 10 times rule in your mind, you'll have a much better chance of creating an LZ that the pilot is actually going to want to land in rather than just saying, okay, they, we know where you are, here's some survival supplies, we'll be back in you know a few hours with something else that can land here. Um, and you, when the helicopter is coming in for a landing, you want to be facing the cockpit so that the pilot can see you. 
because the pilot is always in command of the helicopter. Yes? Um, well, I'm, I'm not a pilot either. This was from a, an army ranger had a website where he was talking about all of this. But there's, there's apparently a lot of other, pro like, well, like on the Osama bin Laden raid, the helicopter actually, they had like some powered descent thing that happened that it was still trying to fly, but because of the way the, the downdraft was ricocheting off of walls, the, the helicopter lost lift. So they would rather, I, my understanding is they would rather try to fly it like an airplane than force it to fly like a helicopter. Um, but, and this is the last part is very important. The pilot is always in command. Um, he's going to give you orders. You accept those orders. Um, you don't want to be like the, Cr the Cranbrook Institute of Science kids who were, this, uh, this was a school in Michigan. They were camping in some national park in Tennessee during the storm of the century, the blizzard that swept through. And they were berating the National Guard pilot who picked them up to the point that when I heard what they said, I was like, man, if I was the pilot, I would have told them to get out and walk. Um, no, like when you're on the ground, it's like, well, we're here. Okay, you're still here. That's fine. I'll, I'll send somebody else. You know, you can wait and freeze. Um, if you don't have radios and stuff, you need to think about primitive signaling methods. Um, mirrors are good for a primitive signaling method, like I said before. And CDs are free, very much. And they have a hole in the middle that you can fight with them. So they're great. Whistles, smoke signals. Yes, AOL, AOL actually did us all a service. Um, um, so like whistles, smoke signals, you want to remember that three of any signal indicates distress classically. So three fires in a row or a triangle, three whistle blasts, three gunshots, although I would save my ammo. Um, navigation, you want to remember to, was, it, was, was there a question? Okay. You want to remember to stay together as a group. Um, GPS is probably the first thing us geeks think about and it's great when it works correctly, but I've seen GPS receivers wig out, especially under forest canopy. Um, maybe the new receivers, like the first star three or whatever, are better, but uh, I don't trust them. I've just seen GPSs lead me in circles when I know where I'm going. So if I didn't know where I'm going, that'd be bad. However, if you have one that works and you've got a good fix and a good radio, um, you pretty much can call them and say, hey, I'm here, pick me up. Um, I like map and compass. You're limited to the area on the map, but if you have like a Delorme Atlas for the state or the province that you're in, um, you have this enormous area and a fairly high resolution map that will give you features that you can navigate from. Um, the compasses I like are the orienteering style compasses, but you need to practice with all this stuff. Uh, and the good thing is, is unlike GPS, it doesn't run on batteries. And you don't need to see satellites, which is the problem we had on the forest canopy. Um, landmark navigation is good if you're dealing with actual fixed landmarks like roads or power lines. I didn't put pipelines in there, but I thought about that because I was thinking about Keystone XL and stuff like that, or the Alaska pipeline. Anything that people have built leads someplace where people are. So you follow those features if you find them. Um, you don't want to trust things like the thickness of moss on trees or your own innate sense of direction because these don't have any fixed we actually don't have a sense of direction. It's been scientifically proven. Um, and I've seen moss growing on all different sides of trees, not just the north side. Um, there's also celestial navigation. If you can find Polaris at night, you know which way north is. You also know your latitude um, if you're like out at sea, that sort of thing. If you know that the sun is only actually rising due east and due west on the equinoxes, and in the summer it rises northeast of that, and in the winter it rises southeast of that, then you have a pretty good idea of direction throughout the day as if you can see the sun. Um, if you have things like sextants and, set and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I guess I'm, I'm probably running out of time here. Okay, I'll keep going until the other speaker shows up. Um, so th I'm actually pretty close to done. Here's the, the last section, self-defense. Um, we might skip improvised weapons. That's rocks, sticks, and clubs and stuff. Um, I like firearms. If they're illegal in your area, keep one in your kit. But you want to figure out which one, though. The classic survival rifle is the Armalite, now Henry, AR-7, which the U.S. Air Force uh, included in their survival kits in the 1960s. It's a 22 long rifle with an eight-round magazine, semi-automatic. Um, the barrel comes off, the action comes off, and all of it fits into a waterproof floating stock. That sounds pretty awesome, until you realize it's a 22 with bad sights. And you can't field strip it. 
Uh, the only way I've ever found to clean it is to just pour like um, powder solvent into the gun and work the action until all the gunk comes out, which is not the what you want to be doing in a survival situation. And unless you do that, it's unreliable. Um, so I really, I mean, it's a nice range toy, but I don't like the air stomach. Then people say, well, what about the Savage survival arm? It's this break open, you know, 22 on top, 410 shotgun on the bottom. Um, well, that's cool, but both of those are only good for small game. And uh, you only get two shots, one of each, if you're out hunting, because you're going to have to break it open and then reload real quick, and um, that's hard. Um, and what happens if Mr. Bear shows up? Now you've got a 410. That's going to be awesome. So what I like is a pump action shotgun in 12 or 20 gauge, because you can hunt anything from a chipmunk to a grizzly bear with it, depending on whether you put like birdshot or a slug in. It's easy to clean under field conditions. They practically don't break. They're robust and reliable. It's easy to use once you're used to, full use to the recoil, and you have a greater probability of one-shot kill. They also cost the same as the other two guns I mentioned, and they're legal in all 50 states and most Canadian provinces. Plus, you've got follow-up shots just in case. You just pump the action one more time, and you're good to go. Um, this is the improvised weapons. I'm going to kind of skip that because um, what, next speaker? He's coming in? OK. Um, this is the pretty much the final thing I had, the $100 survival kit. Basically, these items I was mentioning, you can get them all for about $100 for all of it, if you do free. Um, <laughs> you know, and keep that all in a military surplus bag, and you're pretty much good to go. I think um, these are the three most important things. Be prepared, maintain your situational awareness and will to survive, and stick together in a group. Um, if there's any questions, I do probably don't have time for that, but I could maybe go upstairs for a breakout session if people wanted to talk to me for that. But uh, that's it. I actually made it. I'm, I'm kind of amazed. <laughs> Thank you.